So it's now two minutes over two o'clock. So I, I believe it's time to, time to start. So uh, welcome everyone to the Diamas and Palomera projects uh, joint webinar, seeking to make the life of the learned society publisher easier. Uh, the goal of this uh, webinar is to engage learned societies and to learn how to best support their publishing operations. Uh, my name is Janne Pölönen. I work at the Federation of Finnish Learned Societies, TSV, and TSV is the co-organizer of this event together with uh, Spark Europe. Uh, the European DMS project aims to foster diamond open access publishing throughout Europe and seeks to understand and mitigate the challenges that learned society publishers experience with open access scholarly communication. The Palomera project on, public, on policy alignment uh, for open access books aims to accelerate the transition to open access for books through policy. Uh, the Learned Society Journal is the archetype of community-led uh, scholarly publishing, a sector that serves many academic communities, cultures, and languages. Learned societies are therefore at the heart of Diamond Open Access Publishing. Diamond Open Access is the free is free both to read and publish. Publishing journals, books, and book series, learned societies may experience both challenges and benefits from publishing open access. So both uh, Diamas and Palomera projects are keen to learn how we can best support learned societies and their publishing operations, uh, considering their financial constraints. Uh, today, we have in the webinar around 175 registered participants from over 31 countries. So we can say that there is a broad interest uh, in, the, in the topic. Uh, most of the participant, uh, participants indicated to publish both journals and books. And some of, uh, and also large share of the participants publish only journals. But there are also um, the book publishers. Uh, in the audience. And yes, most of the participants uh, publish all or some of the society's publications in open access. This is the program for today. Uh, so this is the opening. Uh, after that, I will uh, talk about learned societies in the European scholarly communication landscape. Then Vanessa Proudman from Spark Europe We'll, we'll talk about sustaining open access publishing, lessons from two uh, EU projects. Uh, then Mikael Laxo, uh, now uh, working at the University of Tampere, but also working as an expert for TSV, the Diamas project, uh, and talks about potential, potentials and challenges for collaboration and shared services for learned society publishers. Then we will have Paul questions and time for discussion, uh, moderated by Mikael. And finally, I will close the event. <laughs> so uh, without further ado, I will uh, continue with my, with my presentation on the learned societies in the European scholarly communication landscape. So uh, firstly, I would like to highlight some results of the Diamas uh, deliverable. We produced national overviews on sustaining institutional publishing in oh. Europe. This included uh, 10 country case studies uh, exploring how institutional publishing operations are funded, sustained, and influenced by policy and publishing traditions. Uh, as part of uh, this, included also uh, quantitative information on number of publishers, fields, and languages of journals 
as well as information on higher education systems. So here you can see results of bibliometric analysis of the journal landscape and how, how different it seems in, uh, when based on more extensive Ulrich's uh, database compared to more exclusive uh, Web of Science database. In, in both databases, uh, journals published by learned societies uh, cover around 10% of the landscape. But there are large differences between countries. We see in Ulrich's web and both web of science that, for instance, in Croatia and Finland, uh, learned societies play a more dominant role, while, for instance, in, in Spain, university publishers are, are very important, whereas in some other countries like Germany, Netherlands, and the UK, professional publishers dominate the landscape. Anyhow, uh, a stronger role for learned societies in the Euro European landscape. And of course, from this picture, we only see who is publishing the journals. We don't uh, see the full scope of collaboration between different type of publishers. And this, I wanted to show you just a little uh, a teaser from a study that we are currently preparing with colleagues, uh, Necera Taskin, Emanuel Kulczyski, and Mikhail Lakso on role of different type of publishers and their collaborations based on Web of Science journal list. And here we can see that almost one third of all journals in Web of Science are actually involving learned societies either as publisher or as collaborator. Well, now we're now turning to uh, Tiamas landscape uh, survey, which was carried out in during the spring 2023. We had uh, almost 700 uh, respondents from uh, all over Europe. Um, and this is the part of the respondents uh, population that I will be focusing now. So I'm, I'm trying to focus on comparing uh, learned society publishers with other publishers. So first of all, on the left side, we see that we asked what type of legal entity is the IPSP. I will soon say what is IP and SP or its parent organization. And almost 26% um, of the respondents say that they are private nonprofit organizations shown here with red color and orange color. And from those respondents, I identified 74 uh, respondents that were learned societies based on the name of the respondent organization. So on the right side, we see that uh, the responses to question what type of, of IPSP the respondent is representing. And we have two types. First of all, service providers that are tasked by institution or institutional publisher with carrying out specific services. So the SPs, and we have on the other hand, IP, institutional publishers, the entity that controls publishing operations. And, and slightly a smaller share of society respondents were uh, service providers. In this study and, and the following slides, I will be focusing on 546 IPs of which 12% are societies and 88% are other type of respondent organizations. So now I, now I would like to quickly highlight what we learn, what is specific to uh, learned society publishers in the institutional publisher landscape. So first of all, we learn from the le left side that society publishers have more rarely a parent organization and they have uh, quite often smaller budgets than the other type of um, uh, institutional publishers. We also see that society publishers have less often employed staff and rely more on in-kind support than the other type of institutional publishers. So for instance, on the left side, we see that over 
40% of the society IPs have no uh, paid staff at all. And then very large uh, share of the society publishers have only one full-time equi equivalent of, of, of uh, employed uh, staff. <laughs> and on the right side, we can see clearly that uh, whereas both type of IPs rely on uh, the same way on monetary income, non-monetary or in-kind support is uh, considerably more important for large share of society IP, IPs. Uh, we also learned from the Tiamas landscape survey that society IPs rely more on member fees, uh, income from event organization, and they rely on time-limited grants and public funding. So these are some of the characteristics of learned society, publishers. And we also see that society publishers uh, typically publish a fewer number of journals. So vast majority, or almost half of the societies publish only one journal and almost all are published from one to five journals at most. So they are, as publishers, have, have uh, less important budgets and they publish uh, in a smaller scale, so to say. And uh, on the right side, we see what kind of services uh, society publishers uh, provide compared to other type of IPs. And maybe the main difference is that uh, society publishers offer less often training and support and advice. So one might interpret, it, interpret this in a sense that society IPs may have a need for support of this, this kind of service. And finally, uh, a brief look uh, at the uh, profile of multilingualism and open access. So on the left side, we can see that on one hand, society published journals, uh, a, a slightly sl larger share is English only, but also slightly larger share is also mm -hmm. only in other languages than English. So there is uh, at the both ends, a small difference compared to other type of uh, IPs. And this, of course, may reflect the fact that societies are both very much nationally oriented, but they can also be uh, entirely international in their scope of operations. On the right side, we see that uh, there are no large differences between societies and other type of organization in the op uh, share of open access content of journals. Uh, however, in case of books, we see that uh, uh, there are uh, somewhat more uh, book publishing content that is not openly available. So this is uh, the part on uh, role of learned societies and their characteristics in the European landscape. And I think uh, uh, we don't have really much time for these uh, questions now, but we can turn to questions later on when we have uh, the time for poll questions and discussion. And I would now like to invite uh, Vanessa to talk on, on the sustainability. And I stop sharing. I think everybody can see my screen, I hope. Uh, my name is Vanessa Proudman. I'm the director of Spark Europe. Um, and I'd like to share some insights from the two projects that Jan has been talking about. Um, we really wanted to gain an, a better understanding of some of those um, financial challenges um, that um, institutional publishers in particular and including um, society publishers um, what you're grappling with to see how we can better support you going going further. Um, so we looked at diamond publishing, uh, so mainly journals, but we also looked at um, funding um, that was mentioned as part of policy, so open access policies for books. 
So we've got, we're looking at journals and books um, in my presentation. So a uh, quick snapshot on what Diamas is. Uh, I, I think Jan already said what, what it's about, but it's a three year project. We still have uh, uh, some time to go, almost a year to go. So this is why we're really keen to have a good conversation with learning societies to see how we can support you, as I say, going forward to, to, uh, to uh, particularly zoning in on the financial sustainability of your um your journals or um books um so what we did in the diamas project um as jana already mentioned he showed you a snapshot uh, of of some of the survey but we carried out a literature review to understand um what was being mentioned related to this topic um we had two quantitative surveys the one large one that yana talked about but then we zoned in on um specific questions that um uh, looked at understanding uh which mechanisms you use what are some of the uh the the, the intricate um uh options uh that you're using revenue models etc challenges with um collaboration how to uh how to save costs, etc. We had focus groups on the topic and we had interviews. And that's all to inform um, policy recommendations that are uh, in the works right now. So I won't be sharing those today, uh, but I'm going to be sharing some of those findings. So first and foremost, and as Jana uh, already mentioned, many of you really re rely on in-kind um, support uh, to make your journals um, or, or publishing work. So uh, the majority we found, and I'm, the, the findings that I have are actually looking at the broad spectrum, not just societies, but many of you are in here. Um, so above all, um, the importance of people and the strong commitment of uh, chief editors, editors, uh, researchers, authors, um, to make uh, publishing work. So uh, there's more of a reliance on in-kind um, work than on monetary resources. And the most frequent in-kind support from the parent organisation that supports uh, publishing are obviously IT services and facilities and the premises where, where you work from, uh, human resource management and financial and legal services, and of course the salaries of the staff doing the work. Uh, for uh, the publishing outfit. So that's first and, and, and foremost, uh, the most important way that um, uh, publishing sustains itself. But um, we also found that um, although two thirds said that they relied on a parent organization, so, uh, and those offer in-kind support, uh, there are there is still a third that uh, does not rely um, on or have the support from a, from another organization. So they need to look for other means. Um, so what do uh, what do publishers and service providers rely on? They also rely on the generosity of public organizations. So that could be ministries, it, uh, it could be um, regional um, uh, research organizations, um, other institutions, uh, charities. But we also found that there are very, very few research funding organizations supporting publishing, be they small or large outfits or um, services or infrastructures. Where we do see national, regional or local funders supporting publishing, they're almost always funding um, those outfits that are um, based in the country of that, uh, of that body despite many of those uh, publishers actually having a much wider reach and many readers from outside that country. There's a real need for vital seed funding and particularly for, if we're looking at uh, society journals who are interested in flipping to OA, that, seeding, that seed funding is really vital and that does exist, but it's few and far between. Um, and we also need it to innovate and to, to provide services that can support um, yourselves, like larger services, like capacity hubs that can provide you with technical expertise, uh, put you in touch with good service providers and, and more. So these are the kinds of things we're thinking about. And of course, as Jan already mentioned, many of you rely on membership fees. You get subsidies from your home institution if you're lucky. Uh, there, there may also be a library open access fund that's, that publishes some of your books. 
um, you may be using the APC or the VAC. Collective funding models are also uh, growing as we speak. Um, and then, of course, I think Jan also mentioned the use of uh, you often subsidize your publishing through events. So managing all of that, and if we look at that many of you don't even have one person or if there is one person uh, responsible, uh, and you have to think about raising fun uh, funds. I mean, that that's um, that's tough. Um, so looking at how you manage that income, then if you are having to uh, 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 look for funds outside of your institution, um, that brings um, lack of continuity, of course, because you're 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 reliant on um, staff that's made available to you. Um, that's perhaps not perfect. Um, and you may have external funds, but they come and go. So there is not like a stable uh, organization of funding around your outfit. But the good thing is, um, if you do get funding from outside, the, uh, through that, um, you're required often to report on, um, uh, to, to track your expenses and the revenues, which, which means that it's much easier to make the case for funding to other funders if you can say what your costs are, which has not always been the case in the past. To, re to, to recap from the Diamas project, the key challenges, uh, so uh, there's a no-brainer there that there's a lack of financial resources for some. Some of you are managing, but I suppose if you're coming to this event, uh, perhaps there is something, uh, uh, that this is a challenge that, that that's uh, shared by you as well. Um, secondly, there's also, as I mentioned, the lack of staff stability and permanence that comes through this temporary funding or in-kind contributions. And then, of course, the dependence on, on parent organisations. Uh, there are positives and negatives, which I've already mentioned. Um, now, there is an opportunity to try to reduce costs and to save costs through collaboration. And I think Mikkel will talk to you about that. And we'd really like to explore with you today also what could be possible, could we build things for you going forward um, to help you out on different levels here. So 70% 70, 70 from the survey expressed their wish to collaborate more to save costs in, in areas which are hard to get that right expertise, right? Like IT services, training or support and advice, uh, production services and communication. Um, but there are, of course, challenges uh, when you're collaborating, as we all know, um, if you're working within a particular context and scale, if you want to scale up, to what extent is that is, is that possible in that context, the, the technical and skill obstacles that you depend upon, um, the time, and then also if you are using some shared services, it's also to be mindful that some of those technical services and infrastructures are financially unstable, uh, not completely, but you know, we also need to be mindful to um, to uh, support them going forward. So not not per se yourselves, but um, the, uh, the community uh, more broadly. Um, so we need to strengthen permanent public government funding, more international funding is needed. Um, we need time limited grants, particularly for those of you who would like to flip to OA. Um, we need funds for infrastructure that supports uh, many uh, society publishers. Um, and of course, we really need um, policy to change, in particular in institutions, to recognise in-kind and voluntary work. Very briefly, I'd like to just outline a few things from the Palomero project. So these are uh, mentions of, of funding in policy. So we didn't do a, a thorough study of the funding of open access books, but what we found also is that institutions are critical to funding open access and they do this through, through subsidies or they have open access funds at their libraries, for example. There are some instances of government uh, open access funding. Uh, 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 for example, in Germany, there, there are uh, the federal state of Brand Brandenburg, for example, provides 100,000 euros to its researchers in their region for open access. Um, and of course, research funders um, through project funds uh, uh, support open access books. There are time limited grants and other sub sub subsidies and, and more. 
a couple more slides and then I'm done. Um, and then if we're looking at uh, the policy findings um, related to funding on, on books, so this is often uh, limited to the grant period if it's from a research funder, within, a, but it can also be within a specific time frame uh, within a year that you have to apply for that funding. But there are, the institutions are also stepping up and are supporting open access book funding. Um, they either uh, fund a uh, combined with other resources. So if, if this comes from research funders, they will then plug any gaps. Um, if there are no other funding streams available, certain institutions will, will only then step in to fund um, open access books. Or if the grant has expired, or if the research funder only, only uh, pays until, until the end of the grant, the institution may step in to, uh, to pay for uh, your open access book. Uh, and I think I already uh, mentioned the, the bridging funding gap. So I'd like to just uh, remind you to uh, look to your institution to see what is possible, because I think the libraries are often managing those funds. So do speak to them. There are opportunities there. Um, but how, how, do, how do we make those choices on what to fund uh, if we look at all the fruits on the right hand side? Um, Many policies, they define what they mean by, by books, the mono, monographs, book chapters, other edited scientific works or dissertations, but there are others. Um, but there are conditions uh, sometimes on what they pay from which disciplines, if it's unpublished, peer-reviewed infrastructure. Um, and also they want to maintain sometimes high standards for OA, which you do as well. So if you're listed in the directory of open access books, for example, or if you're in a national registry, um, or if you follow certain national publishing requirements or standards, the likelihood of being funded is higher. Um, and there are certain instances where funders don't uh, cover those costs. Um, and I think that's going to be my last slide. Uh, some also requiring you to use DOIs, ORCIDs, um, open licensing. So I think um, there are lots of opportunities, but there are also um, things to, to keep in mind if you are looking for that funding. So there will be some policy recommendations coming out based on this, uh, coming out very soon from both of these projects. So do watch out. And we really want to see how concretely we can help you with a tool set that's being developed in the Diamas project, for example. So any questions later on, um, I'll be around. Uh, and thank you for the one reference that I used. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Vanessa, uh, for the very, very interesting and broad overview of learnings from the two projects. Now it is time to invite Mikhail to uh, talk on the collaboration uh, shared services for learning societies. Yes. Thank you, Janne. Uh, can you see and hear me okay? Yes? Perfect. Good. Uh, so, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for the opportunity to have your attention for what I think is a super uh, interesting and relevant topic uh, that should get more attention both in research and science policy, I think, because a lot is in the hands of uh, learned societies to, to, to make those important changes happen towards uh, what I would say a better scholarly communication environment. Um, I'm not really here to give uh, answers. We are still in the phase of uh, asking the right questions and collecting uh, data and impressions. So if you came here for uh, three uh, silver bullets to solve, solve both money and resource problems at once. This is unfortunately not yet that webinar. Maybe at some point in the future, we will have those, those answers. But for now, I think uh, I would like to have this short moment to kind of pitch the perspective of the, the Diamas project uh, and the Palavera project for what increased collaboration could have uh, in terms of potential for making almost every aspect a bit better. Well, 
uh, I, somehow at the root of it all, I'm still a researcher. And uh, I think even though I picked out here what is kind of a definition for what open science is, it highlights collaboration. And I think um, I like to use these types of definitions at the start of most of my presentations, just to anchor the whole narrative into something a bit more firm. And I'm gonna use it here as well. So I picked out this uh, definition that highlights that, you know, the best of open science is collaborative and uh, shared. And I think uh, there's something, some parallel to kind of draw there from thinking about Okay, open science as a process is best happening through collaborative networks uh, between researchers facilitated by infrastructures. But I think also on the publishing level and on the particularly the institutional publishing level, there are many bridges to build and many new uh, collaborations and communities to, to strengthen in order to make everything a bit more open and a bit more cost effective for the future so that everyone could thrive. Uh, and I think another kind of inspirational anchor point for the whole, uh, well, for the whole DMS project, but in particularly this collaborative data collection, like collecting impressions for potential collaboration stems from this one kind of one observation that was made already in the Diamond uh, OA Journal study that there is this archipelago of different usually small uh, organizations that publish usually just one publication or then maximum a handful of different publications. So uh, that's already kind of was apparent from, from Janne's presentation as well, that it, it's quite a particular uh, type of organization that is not doing publishing as its main bread and butter, but uh, in addition to something else, be it a learned society or a university or, or something else. And I think that also requires a specific set of kind of perspective on the whole thing. How could we help with building those bridges and setting the boats afloat in the archipelago that currently exists to make everything a bit smoother? I don't like citing myself, but I was involved in putting together a report on the different layers of action that would be needed to uh, facilitate more collective action and, you know, it's basically a synonym for collaboration. Like collective action just means that everyone should move roughly in the same direction at the same time to make big changes happen, be them, you know, here metaphorically small fish or, or small publishers. The idea is the same, that if we all would have the same vision for where we want to be, the same goals set uh, on the horizon, uh, we can change big things even though we are small. And here, here's just a few quotes from, from the report that it basically needs both the, the bottom-up kind of belief and bottom-up uh, adoption of these ideas, let's say among individual researchers, among individual editors, among individual uh, learned societies, that this is something we want to bet on and move towards, as well as then some kind of top-down uh, help with building those bigger infrastructures, uh, building uh, the different platforms for where this could happen. So there is both kind of a top-down, bottom-up thing that needs to happen simultaneously, and then um, a bit of technical bits put into place, but also a lot of just social change, uh, kind of change management, going from one kind of culture to another of, of being more, more collaborative and trying to see those opportunities for, for making it a bit more effective. So why is this like, super important. I think uh, there are, I won't say millions, but thousands of small questions, small problems, small processes that individual learned societies publishing uh, scholarly works are thinking about, but just in isolated and separated chambers around Europe and the world. But that could be facilitated by just having more common knowledge, uh, knowledge basis, let's, let's call it that. It sounds like a technical term, but, but more opportunities to learn from each other, share working solutions, maybe even share resources to some degree. Uh, it doesn't only have to do with money or just technical uh, know-how, but also just other types of uh, resources that are not needed full-time within one organization or one uh, publication can maybe be shared a bit so that we would all win by, by um, 
not having to be the world's best expert in every area of scholarly communication if we are operating a, a, a journal or book publisher. And even though I would say there's some kind of uh, uh, kind of challenge here that I think many of the tools that we are using for uh, making publishing technically uh, possible are easier to use than ever. It's almost like the web interfaces for OJS or uh, uh, Open Journal System or, or some other similar open source solution for managing publications. It's easier than ever, but there's a lot of still technical requirements set by funders, uh, set by indexing um, databases, so that there's still a lot of technical know-how, and I would say an increasing amount of different interconnected systems and technical standards that need to be still monitored that maybe aren't always if the pub publishing isn't done as a full-time operation where you can keep uh, the pace with all the, those changing requirements and new metadata standards that are getting, getting rolled out. So it's kind of a big challenge. Uh, and there is, I think, also something to be said for starting to build and think about funding mechanisms that would go beyond just funding one uh, operation at a time. I'll, I'll get to that soon, but but so that if we would rather have, some would call them maybe collective funding models, consortial funding models, but at least a bigger pool of both doers and funders, there would be more of a critical scale for both funders to contribute to a larger uh, pool of, of, of doers or publishers, but also it would create more stability probably in funding in those that are involved in actually making stuff happen within the, those publishing organizations. So I think we need to maybe zoom out a bit when it comes to thinking about these funding instruments and how those could maybe be tweaked a bit to, to work for a better uh, environment. And what are those obstacles here, like fallen trees, or are they just growing horizontally? I don't know, but they're in the way uh, anyways. And uh, there's many of those obstacles that are, I think, that I already know. As I've been the editor-in-chief of a small scholarly society journal, and those that I know of from my closest network in Finland, that there's many challenges that come in the way for like thinking about these strategic collaborations and and use, using more shared services. And it's just the scarcity of time and resources and mainly focusing on keeping the lights on and getting the next issue out or uh, remodeling the web page or, or something like they're very practical. And the, the, the planning horizon is usually, unfortunately, at least for me, quite short when I was involved in that more heavily so that there wasn't really a, a time to sit down and think and uh, ponder on these optimization uh, methods. But there should also maybe be platforms or some types of uh, matchmaking tools for, for making it happen so that one wouldn't have to sit with an empty sheet of paper and dream up uh, a vision, but there could maybe be a bit of a breadcrumbing there, services that could uh, feed those ideas and those connections. We'll also get into that today. Uh, but yeah, I won't go digging into all of these individually here, but I really think this last point, the funding mechanisms, that's somehow, I think, um, quite close to where it boils down to, where where some type of change could happen that could facilitate more incentives for, for collaboration. This is, again a, sh again, a shameless plug for some work I was involved in, in mapping uh, public, publicly funded uh, mechanisms for uh, journals in, in Europe. And uh, I think the, the most kind of concerning and the implication here is that it's quite few countries. Yes, Finland is not among those few countries that have these very short term and competitive uh, grants, but there's quite a lot of countries where um, the journals aren't funded in a long term and predictable way. They have to compete uh, almost like research grants in order to ensure uh, some external funding to their operations. Of course, a lot can be subsidized by in-kind and volunteer effort or maybe be working in conjunction with a university or a lear learned society that has extra resources to invest in a publication function. But there is something to be said for thinking about how to create more predictable funding mechanisms and funding mechanisms that would 
encourage collaboration. How to do that within the terms and the design of how these would be distributed is not really up for me to say. But I think money has, even though it's not a lot of money here, these are usually just subsidies for keeping the you know uh, balances on on a positive rather than a negative in the in the long run for the publications. But but for even for maintaining that, I think there's uh, considerations for what could funders that have money and a willingness to support um, scholarly publishing, how could they give give money so that it would also stimulate and create these collaborative uh, networks increasingly more than there is today. You can see here, I'm not like a visual designer. This is uh, not beautiful, but uh, in the, within the DMS project, the, the remaining time of this year and going into the next, we are collecting information. This is also kind of like a not so stealthy mission to do so, but these different types of interactions with uh, with different groups of or organizations that are publishing, we're trying to understand and collect both potential and already realized collaborations on different levels. So for, this is just an example, and uh, as I said, and not a beautiful sketch, but for trying to isolate the different functions as well as the different levels of collaboration. This is like where we are currently, but um, I think maybe even by listening to some of you today and hearing uh, your ideas here, my perspective might change a bit on how we structure this uh, going forward. But it would be nice if we could start placing in and creating kind of a canvas or a map for what are some already working uh, collaboration constellations and uh, what are some that might have remaining obstacles that would need to be worked around in order to achieve those bigger goals. Um, Vanessa already told you something about the Palomero project, uh, the, the general circumstances. Uh, there I've been particularly involved in this uh, policy mapping and trying to figure out how open access book policies are either similar or dissimilar to each other. That's been one of the main main activities within that project because there's just so many policies and they break down into so many pieces when you start doing it that it's um, it's quite a big endeavor and we've had a great team uh, working on it. But also here, I think uh, even within policy making and within how individual organizations, both funders, uh, national policymakers, uh, universities, how they formulate these policies can also stimulate or hinder uh, collaboration. And I think that that's also something to think about, like how certain type of restrictions or uh, frameworks for what's allowed or encouraged or funded, how that then can stimulate or create collaboration, for example, for OA book publishing within uh, specific countries. Uh, and there is, I think, not a threat, but there is uh, a consideration here to balance between the nationally oriented learned societies and those that are internationally oriented. And I think book publishing, I wouldn't say more than journal publishing, but it is really, uh, there's quite a stark divide there between uh, publishers that are really internationally oriented and those that are uh, nationally oriented to try to figure out policies and, and models that wouldn't that wouldn't hinder anyone from uh, growing the level of open access while not also overly favoring either or the other to really um, heavy handedly uh, steer the whole ship. But yeah, this is again something I don't have answers for, but just something I learned from interviews and surveys that there is a quite divide in how people see that national versus international axis of particularly OA book publishing and uh, I think we should keep that in mind in, in uh, figuring out ways to keep a balance that it is in line with whatever science policy is, is, is striving for. My, my thoughts here before I, I kind of let, let loose and let, let you speak and, and uh, contribute is that I think we would need to have a bit of a more kind of a clean slate. We can't just slightly adjust here and there. We need
incentives to use and grow those shared services. Um, and also for service providers, I think there are already some promising examples of this, but having kind of lightweight service packages for copy editing, for technical maintenance, or whatever, so that one wouldn't have to commit for not a lifetime, but for a very long time beyond the planning horizon of, of the organization and beyond the budget that, that's known for certain, to ask for commercial help where it makes sense. For some of those very labor-intensive stages of production that could be outsourced, it would be nice to have smaller packages that could be paid a la carte uh, and easily through a maybe integrated web platform so that there would be minimal fuss with transferring files all around. Okay, let's move on. Uh, I'm running out of my 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 slot here, but <laughs> within the DMS project, I just like to highlight you that we've already uh, put in a date for when you remember that ugly table I showed you on <laughs> on the twenty third of October. Uh, I and others from the DMS project will be organizing uh, uh, a collaborative webinar that will focus on only that, uh, gathering input uh, feedback on how we should structure uh, that whole thing together with examples. So this was just more like a teaser or, or a scare tactic to get you to not show up. But either way, you know what's coming. And I hope to see many of you uh, during that event as well. But when these ideas have matured a bit, and we've also gained some, some sharper perspective just based on the discussions today. But please keep following the DMS page for information on that. But. I think it's time for some interactivity. You've been listening very kindly, uh, but we'd like to know a bit more about you. So, uh, Janne, could we start up the the engine, so to say, for the yes. poll? Uh, thank you, Mikael. So, indeed, we can start with uh, the poll questions. Or what do you think, Vanessa and Mikael? If there are any uh, quick questions, we have been talking for a long time to any of, of us three speakers, should we take one or two questions now before maybe the poll? We could, maybe we could take like completely open questions. Now we have targeted open our own questions we'd like to ask you later, but maybe we'll give the opportunity to ask questions in this direction as well. Yeah. So please just raise hand or put a question in the chat, if any at the moment. There will be opportunity to, to of course, ask questions and come back to the discussion later on. Uh, I don't see any hands or, or questions in the chat. So maybe we start with the poll. Yeah, I think we, we could try, try out uh, just yes. a few short questions. So let's start uh, with the first question. Uh, I think you should be able to see this now. Is that correct? Yes. yes. So the first question, do you mainly run your uh, publishing in-house, outsource publishing to commercial publishers or outsource publishing to not-for-profit publishers? I think we might already have a winner. Yeah, it seems. Um, mm. Let's wait. Yeah. Uh, almost half of the participants have uh, voted. Should we still wait for more no, answers? Maybe some people are fortunate or unfortunate to not be involved in direct publishing duties. So, so of course, not everyone needs to respond to to every question. But, <laughs> but, uh, but I think it's super interesting to see that it's like a really high share that uh, are running it in house. 
and that corresponds also to my gut feeling to how quite many uh, smaller learned learned society publishers are operating the the functions. Indeed, and it's interesting to see that uh, outsourcing is taking uh, place with uh, both commercial publishers and not for profit publishers. So that's that's also uh, interesting result here. So should we end this poll and move on to the next one or? Yeah, let's take the next uh, next question. Okay, so I end uh, this one. So there is a second question. To what extent do you depend on publishing income for your society? Entirely, largely, somewhat, not at all. Seems to be a bit more spread on this theme. I guess this can also be one of the challenges when moving to to open access. If if there is a large reliance on this, on how to then retain some of that income, also in the open access uh, model. Yes, we know, for example, in Finland, where where a lot of societies publish uh, one journal, typically in the national language. And it is often tied to the uh, uh, be uh, member membership uh, benefit. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are uh, worries about loss of membership if if journal goes if any, open access. Yeah, and if anyone wants to comment on this or give some context, it would be would be nice. We have those guided guided questions as well. But but if there's something that you think should be should be known, <laughs> you you may please uh, raise your hand. I think it would be really interesting mm. to hear those who are entirely uh, dependent or largely just to hear a little bit about um, about your publishing and whether that's always been the case or would anybody like to share something? can also be in the chat if you don't feel comfortable speaking out or just send us an email. We would love to hear from you. Definitely, yeah. Mm -hmm. So should we consider uh, this is the final result? I think we have stabilized. Yes. Okay, so maybe we move on to the uh, third poll, poll question. Mm -hmm. And the third poll question is your society already open access or transitioning to open access publishing? And the options already open access, transitioning to open access, not yet open access. I'm seeing in the chat that people can't see the total poll oh. results. So I think we're going to need to so ah. it's odd because we can see it so we're thinking that you can too so i think if we can read that out once we get there would be would be good ah okay so maybe that uh, that's because uh, we are hosts and then we can see what's on the screen maybe and we we indeed need to push a button for sharing the result so let's let's see So now almost half of the participants have participate, have answered, and we have uh, three fourths of of responses that 
society has is already publishing open access. And, and we have 14% transitioning to open access and not yet open access is 11%. But if we think that this is more or less a, a stabilized result, we can try to share the result this time. So I end the poll and uh, let's see how, how this works. So can you now all see the result? Oh, great. Mm -hmm. So uh, my apologies for, for the mistake uh, in managing the poll in the two first cases. We can go back uh, a bit later and just quickly take a look at what was the end result if it's still recorded. Yeah, I th yeah, we can do it later as well. But if you go back, there is a possibility to share those earlier ones as well, but within that window. But uh, was it so that these, these were the poll questions? Yes, think, these were the yes. poll questions. That's what I was feeling as well. Um, so let's see. Stop, stop sharing this. Yes. And I think the next question we had was, uh, we were quite curious to know what publishing platforms you you use. So if people could use the chat for that, that would be really useful. Oh, there we are. Yeah, I think for this one, uh, since you're not, you don't seem that talkative, but we'll get you warmed up. Uh, but if you could in the chat, just mention uh, what type of platforms or web pages you use for publishing that would be really helpful for us to to know what's going on mm -hmm. a lot of ogs <laughs> yes, Johan, we know, we know. It's uh, the Janeway pioneer. Mm -hmm. Dirty Park. Mm -hmm. no, but this, this seems very good and professional, maybe those that are using some type of blog platform aren't writing here, but this seems, you seem to have things in order. So that's that's good. Good, good platforms for managing, managing these. Hmm. Okay, I think we got a feel for, for what we have as platforms. We could move over to what I had as a, uh, a question here that we had in mind um, would be interesting. Like this is maybe the million dollar question. So to say that if if you are a, a diamond uh, OA publisher, how are you sustaining the operations? Like uh, things, even non-profit and volunteer based things uh, still cost something you need you can't create create it out of thin air so how to how to make it happen uh does anyone have good comments on this the the floor is open because uh, i think everyone is kind of looking for any any inspiration for how how this can be managed probably also those that are considering a transition you may use the chat as well but it would be nice to hear some of your voices as well So just picking out some here, uh, proceeds from subscription journals, 
a consortial library model from the Open Library of Humanities, yes. Uh, there's the Government uh, Scientific Council, funds diamond journals, society memberships. Mm, so it's a bit of a bit of everything, it seems. It, as as expected, we we knew knew from the Diamas survey and and earlier that it's usually it's not one. It's just one model that works everywhere or is uh, in in action, but quite many different different ones. And also this uh, organizational subsidies or or sponsoring for journal activities is probably also quite important in many many contexts. Yeah, we're making notes. This is good. This is good to know. And look into look into closer when we are considering those like examples of collaboration and uh, and what might be some obstacles for for making diamond a reality. But I see no no hands. But uh, that might just be the type of day we are at. I'll move here on to the, the next question I had. Um, this is, again, something that ties to the earlier question, that if, if you are considering uh, diamond open access and have to abandon article-based charges, uh, how <laughs> what are the main obstacles to not cutting the leash, but shall we say going full diamond open access rather than what most people would call just gold or APC driven open access. Does anyone have a experiences from this type of path from first being fee based, but then going completely free for authors over time? And is that a normal path or is it just straight from subscription straight to diamond? like a band-aid. Mm -hmm. I'm monitoring the chat here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is of course with the, with the with the actual money problem uh, in conjunction with APCs that you need to the authors need to come up with the money from somewhere from their institution or funder or somewhere also kind of this potential for being suspected of predatory publishing if you're a new and upcoming journal so it it can can give an, a more legitimacy if you're not asking for that money then at least you're not you're not out at least for scamming people for money so well, that's, uh, of course, one clear benefit in addition to many others. Mm. Yes, and libraries are, are trying to save money by, by betting on diamond open access or hoping for that to be the prevailing model. Mm. Yeah, and of course, these author fees don't have to be mandatory they can be these VACs that were also mentioned earlier voluntary author contributions that those authors that have the possibility to pay usually by their funder or or, or, or employer they can contribute to keeping the system afloat but they then don't create an impossible obstacle for those that are outside those types of structures mm -hmm. Yes, should we go on and see? We, if you can get one one person to open their microphone, it will be a success. Let's see. This is something that keeps me awake at night, looking at that table and what type of services one could solve with money. Uh, because many of the things are kind of anchored in scholarly practices, uh, editor, ed editor uh, perspectives, where you can't really outsource uh, without thinking about it at least like what type of tax tax can you outsource to well the lowest bidder or or whoever is is uh, doing whatever uh, at the quality level you're expecting how what 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 could be solved with a bit more money uh that's what i would be interested to to learn more about 
or is it just internal effort employing more persons to the to the within the operation that is the solution or could something be paid for as a service any examples of this that you know of or have experienced or uh, would be very helpful for us to build our case in what what could be some of those tasks unless everybody's saying that they don't pay for any services mm. and they, they do it all themselves that's I'm sure there is some very heroic some services <laughs> <laughs> mm. but yeah i see a lot of good examples in the chat there's uh typesetting and crossref these types of indexing related uh fees uh yeah plagiarism control copy editing typesetting um uh long term preservation mm. proofreading i think what i'd also be curious to know the services that you've been paying for, were you satisfied with those? <laughs> That's the other question. Yeah. Or a yeah. Follow -up. So yeah. You, you paid for them, right? And often you, that comes with demanding a certain quality. Did that always go well? Or would you rather have done it yourself? Or maybe you started doing it yourself and then outsourced it elsewhere and thought again? Did anybody have that experience? You can put that in the chat if you like. Any experiences? when outsourcing or paying for something else that didn't meet with your expectations. Of course, it's never perfect, but any feedback? To help provide you with support going forward. Yeah, because I think maybe not here, but once these concepts and ideas are a bit more mature, it would be nice to put together like a guideline of things to keep in mind and check. And uh, yeah, for anyone considering these types of service uh, provisions. Ah, Johan, please. Yeah, yes, I'll kick off because I mean, mm. Pierre told me in the chat that I should kick it off. So because otherwise <laughs> he says this, if the fir a first person starts talking, then maybe the others will too. I think these are very good examples indeed of, of, of the types of things we pay for and that and it's not always well known. Um, I mean, unless you are an editor, as you know, I'm an editor myself. So I'm, I I mean, you may not see it, but I have my Glossa hat on um, and and my Open Library of Humanities hat. And, and you know, indeed, Crossref costs money. A DOI costs money. It's about, uh, you know, a, a euro and a half or something per DOI, something like that. Uh, typesetting and and copy editing at OLH, we are we also pay for that. Although we as journal editors don't see the cost, they are covered by the OLH. But you know, typesetting and copy editing for a, a Glossa article, I know it's around two hundred, about two hundred euros, something like that. Same at at at, at Glossa Psycholinguistics. That is a very huge cost. Uh, so, so these these costs are very differentiated, and this is something that we should have a, a, a real discussion about with numbers, <laughs> because I mean that's also going to do to to define what we are going to pay in the future. And then the the, the third thing I would like to say is that this is very different also for um, uh, as a function of the the size of the journal you're putting out. I mean, this is also always something I say. If you put out a journal that has fifteen articles a year, right, which is a good number of articles. I'm not saying this This is no judgment. I mean, it's hard work. It's good, good. But this is something that you can do with your editorial board. You can do the copy editing and the typesetting yourself. You have 15 articles. You basically produce an article a month. That is something you can do with your editorial board. However, if you have a journal that has 50 articles a, a year, uh, between 50 and 150, then you really need professional help because that is not something you can manage with your editorial board. That would mean that you are you know, uh, copy editing and type second, uh, setting an article a week. And that is that is a lot for an editorial board. So so the, these are the kinds of things, I think, the, 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 the economies of scale, uh, how the scale of a journal af affects the costs and how you can manage it. Th this is something that we should have an honest and open conversation about. And it's and that uh, there has not been, I think, a forum 
to, to do that. Uh, and, and this will be very useful. And this is also, I think, what you see in the uh, layout printing, you know, typesetting, copy thing, you see it in the chat. And it's I, I, I recognize it all. And this is really something that we, um, we should, yeah, see, I see Sandra saying, we have 15 articles, that's manageable. And it's true, that's manageable. You can do that. I mean, you know, you need re relatively little overhead or relatively little in the amount of services to put that journal out there. Although, you know, you might struggle with HTML. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it allows you to do a PDF, but maybe, maybe XML uh, or HTML is going to be a problem. So these are things we need to have a conversation about as as a, in the, the wider Diamond community. Okay, I'll, I'll stop here because otherwise I'm overstaying my welcome. Maybe no, thank else. you. This was really helpful and, and stimulating uh, to hear. And I think, yeah, this uh, volume uh, aspect is probably very key as well. Uh, yeah, I don't know where it's... Uh, I think there's very different solutions depending on if it's CF yeah, 15, 25, 30, like at some point, yeah, you need that external help. Yeah, also, also, also even, sorry, yeah, also even in terms of how you manage the journal, right? I mean, if you have 15 articles a year, you can probably manage it from your, uh, from a Google, from a Gmail account, right? You don't need a submission system, really, you can just... You know, with 15 people a year, you can you can interact via via email. If you have 50, you really need to keep the overview via submission system. And and so you're it, it, it's I mean, I have often compared this in my discussions with, with, you know, you have a local bakery and you do this, you do this for fun. Right. And you get up in the morning at four o'clock, you make 30 breads and you sell them in the day in the morning. Or you have a slightly more involved operation where you have where you employ two three bakers because you have a volume of about two hundred breads that you are selling in the morning. See what I mean? It's it's very similar. It's from the, the 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 small and artisanal and almost very very local to the slightly broader operation that you that needs that that needs a bit more support. Um, you see what I mean? That's that's it's it's very very different, and that doesn't that is not a judgment of quality. I mean, often the bread from the from the smaller baker is better, right? But but it does need attention. It, it does need particular attention. I mean, to each their own, and to each according to their needs. You know, that is what we should be thinking about. Not everybody has to use OGS. Not everybody has to use expensive typesetting. Mm -hmm. No, but that's very. Good insight, and I'm a fan of the metaphors, so it helped me uh, connecting the dots here. Uh, well, Sandra saying that she cannot manage 15 articles without without the OJ, so mm -hmm. that's that's fine. I mean, you know. I, well, there's also, I guess, a volume that doesn't get published that needs to be managed as well. Those that uh, don't end up getting published, so there's still some manual work there in managing review processes for those that might not make the cut at least the first time. So. Mm. Yeah, native proofreading is something. For instance, um, we have in 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 linguistics, we have a number of people who do that. Actually, who have gotten together and who want to help people writing non-native speakers uh, with their English, and that's really a community service. It's really something that is very useful because you know you have uh, an author, um, yeah, from a country where English is not the first, not not the common language. Sometimes writing. Yeah, articles that are very difficult to access, so you want them to 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 help them. It's not easy. Yeah, and counter compliance was also mentioned by Brett in the chat. So mm -hmm. that's for analytics and stats. Mm -hmm. But these were good, and I think particularly if you know of these. Yes, service names uh, and different things we can look up as homework. Yeah, uh, we, we need to pull these resources, right? I mean, yes. because I mean, we all know a little bit. And if we put all of that together, we know a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the go goal is to build some kind of index of, of these ideas and uh, and then thinking about how those could be even further made available and accessible to even more mm -hmm. small publishers to do maybe i can click onwards i see that yeah the chat is moving but yeah translation not too expensive 
Let's see what we have. Mm. <laughs> big, big questions here that could do, we could talk about for for a whole a whole webinar in itself. But but seeing that there's so much voluntary work, uh, what are some of the kind of main challenges in maintaining, retaining, uh, and uh, keeping things running with this? Uh, because I think surveys and uh, these different statistics that we've gathered only tell like one snapshot or a picture that yes, there's a lot of volunteer uh, work going into the uh, these outlets in in many cases. But how how stable is it? How predictable? How uh, responsive? I don't know if it's uh, people that have probably something else as their main uh, day job. How quickly can they and can they be expected to react on certain uh, publication related tasks, something like this. Does anyone have a reflection on this either in a positive or a negative tone when it comes to uh, use of volunteer or non-salaried uh, resources for, for publishing? It seems things might then be going quite well if there's nothing to report. <laughs> mm -hmm. One month timeline for reviews. Yeah, I guess, yeah, depending on how busy then the editors are or whoever is in charge of uh, managing the pipelines, so to say, of these, uh, these articles, how quickly they can jump back and further facilitate the steps uh, might make publishing a bit slow, maybe compared to some of the hyper efficient uh, production houses that are on the commercial side. Um, but maybe good things come with time. It's uh, there is, I think, still a bit of a culture that we we can allow uh, a bit of patience in these processes. Fortunately, any other insight or reflections on this volunteer? aspect no mm -hmm. then we'll know not that much about it but the time will come when we uh, we get the right question it's maybe a too big of a question at the moment to to really tap into some of those experiences uh Mm, reminding people of deadlines. Yeah, someone needs to be the the boss still and uh, keep the threads in their hands. Mm. Yep, good coordination and infrastructure. That's right. As long as the circumstances are right, it might be that the the platform can facilitate a lot of that. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll move onwards. Here, the next one. Big questions, but without asking the difficult questions, we'll never <laughs> we'll never uh, get get answers to those. So, uh, it might be, and this is like really what we'd be like would like to be able to answer by the end of the year or start of the next to which areas of of publishing activities could we and should we uh, particularly uh, figure out help with or or recommendations or the, also within the Diamas project uh, there we are building this um, capacity hub and different types of resources to support uh, publishing organizations. So what, what could be some of those functions that could be most prioritized in terms of this? Do you have experiences in what could be helpful? What Or what would be nice to get out of your hands, so to say? Maybe that's another way to flip it and <laughs> to get, get a bit of leverage uh, on like a national or even international level on collaborating. 
Mm. Yeah, submission systems, copy editing, typesetting. Mm. So <laughs> quite a lot. Yeah, there is this. There's a lot of small steps that then turn into quite, can quite turn into big, big commitments for anyone who manages multiple of these manuscripts at a time and uh, needs to find persons to chip in in those processes. And it would be nice if those could be predictable and uh, maybe even have some scale to them in a way. Metadata guideline, guidelines. Mm. That's, uh, that's a good idea. I like your thinking there, Johan. Yes, infrastructure put, should be put at the disposal of the journal editor. And that should be the main focus of putting out the journal. Mm -hmm. I'd also like to see that because I can see and maybe have experienced some fatigue in getting a bit too tied up with admin uh, and email reminders rather than the actual uh, work of running a journal that might require some type of an academic degree in, in terms of content or uh, feedback or or editorial tasks. But uh, alas, that's my, my perspective <laughs> as well. Copy editing and layout, mm. indexation. <laughs> yep. Again, with the metaphors, that's good. Bring your ball and the team and you can play. Mm? That is a good good metaphor for this. So creating the circumstances and uh, having having things set up so that there, there is at least a possibility for some scale to happen or collaboration. But I think I want to torture you more with these questions. I think we already have uh collected very much of these and uh, learned a bit about how we can trigger both you and other participants in that next event where we really want answers to those big questions. Uh, we've learned a lot and can start narrowing down and zooming in on these tasks in a more systematic way. So I'm really I really appreciate it that you could contribute your time and experiences to us. But uh Janne, would you like to say some, some final words? I can stop sharing my monochrome screen. Um, thank you, Mikael. And uh, I guess it's time to uh, thank the speakers, uh, Vanessa and Mikael, and also all the participants. Uh, I think it was uh, still very active participation in poll and chat and discussion, even not not even if not so vocal, <laughs> except Johan. And, and <laughs> we will offer you coffee. <laughs> um, but I think what we what we really, really see and what we really have to work towards and what was the main goal of this webinar was to gather. Uh, in same forum for discussion, learned societies and the friends of learned societies. Because I guess we all understand the very important role that learned societies continue to play in scholarly communication landscape as the archetype of a scholarly uh, community and journal or book uh, publishing operation. And that is, and it is indeed serving. Uh, both international uh, science community, but also very much national uh, communities with locally relevant research and platforms for sharing. So uh, I think this, uh, the, the two EU projects that we are uh, representing here, uh, Diamas and Palomera, uh, I really hope we can do uh, further, much more collaboration with, with you participants and other learned societies, and as I said, friends of learned societies in future to, to build a, a stronger ecosystem, uh, especially for diamond open access uh, publishing. And Mikhail already mentioned that there, there will be a webinar 
uh, was it uh, 23rd of October? So uh, we will be sharing information and dis disseminating information about that and invitations. Um, and, and certainly we hope also to, in future, to organize other events targeted to learned societies, either uh, working on uh, definitions of diamond open access and sharing the final results, outcomes of DMS and Palomera projects. So there are very exciting th things uh, to, to share. So uh, I guess uh, we, can, uh, we can stop the webinar. And I would like to very much uh, thank you once again for participation uh, and hope you have a very, very nice uh, rest of the day. Thank you, everyone. Have a nice day. Thank you all. Thank you. See you again. Bye now.